record on this computer. Good. I got it, Pat. Thank you. Okay, should we get started? Absolutely. All right. Well, Pat, did you want to take us off in the beginning or you want me to start? Oh, I just want to welcome you all and, and tell you that Connecticut Poetry Society is so pleased to be able to offer these pop presentations. And um, Barb Jenis is our fairly new pop director, but she's already accomplished amazing things. So I want to thank her very much. Oh. Um, check out our CPS website. Thank you, Pat. Yes, please do. Um, and, and please subscribe, become a, a member of Connecticut Poetry Society, too. We do have a lot of wonderful programming. Even if you don't live in Connecticut, um, we welcome you. So um, and we're 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 also welcoming you to this Poets on Poetry presentation. <clears throat> We've had I, I don't know how many of you were able to join us last month, but we did have um, a presentation on contemporary Palestinian poetry, and we're really excited today um, to offer offer a, a pop on contemporary Israeli poetry. Which brings me to welcoming our presenter. I'm going to, um, just so you know, I'm going to present, put her full bio in the chat, but I'm just going to read you sort of an abbreviated version now. So. Um, Poet, essayist, translator, and Fulbright scholar, um, Rahel Neve Midbar's poetry collection, Salam of Birds, was chosen for the Patricia Bibby First Book Prize and was published by Tebet, I'm not sure if I have that pronounced correctly, Tebet Bach in 2020. She is also the author of the chapbook, What the Light Reveals. Rahel's work has appeared in Blackbird, Prairie Schooner, Grist, and Georgia Review, as well as other publications and anthologies. Her awards include the Crab Orchard Review, Richard Peterson Prize, and nominations for the Pushcart Prize. Rahel is a newly minted PhD <laughs> from the University of Southern California, where her research concerned menstruation and contemporary poetry. She is currently a Fulbright, Fulbright postdoc in Israel, uh, translating the poems of Holocaust poet Abba Kavner. She is also the editor of the anthology Stained, a creative anthology of writing about menstruation, which was just published this past July. So there's more information as you'll see in the chat. Uh, you can check her website. But meanwhile, please welcome Rahel Neve Midbar. Hi, Rahel. Hi. Hi, everybody. And thank you so much for being here. Um, I, I hope I do justice to uh, Israeli poetry. I'm kind of handled my education and my poetic career like an immigrant. So I've done all of my education in America and I'm mostly published in America. I'm not really that well known here. Um, and not many poets who are writing in English here uh, are known in America, maybe only like four or five because of the difference in um, and, and the accessibility of just being able to be published. But um, Tonight I'm going to speak about um, a little bit about the social structure of um, contemporary Israeli poetry, let you know a little bit about the history, and um, hopefully share some beautiful poems. Um, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat, and we're going to save some time at the end. I don't have to be anywhere. It's already eight o'clock after eight o'clock, you know, 10 after eight at night. So I'm happy to hang here as long as you guys are and answer any questions that you have after the presentation. Okay, so Barb, if you wanna start the PowerPoint, that'd be great. Okay, if you, if you hit the little, Wine cup at the bottom, perfect, okay. So here are a few um, of what I would call the dead poets. These, these are poets who are no longer alive, but many of them were instrumental in fashioning um, what uh, Israel Israeli poetry has become. The woman in the upper right-hand corner, Rachel, and she's known as Rachel the Hamishogeret, Rachel the poet. Um, nobody talks about her last name, she uh, uh, was from Russia. She spent a lot of time in Israel. She was a founder of the first kibbutz that is right next to the Kinneret. The name escapes me right now and I didn't jot it down. Um, 
at the start of World War I, she went back to uh, Europe where she contracted tuberculosis and she died there. She did, was not, she didn't, her body is buried in Israel, but she didn't live here at the end of her life. And she died young. I think she was a, not even in, in, maybe in her early forties, but the poems that she wrote became all of the folk songs of Israel. In fact, all of the music in Israel comes from people's poems. It, there's a huge link between the music industry and the poets who write poems in this country. And poetry is a huge, huge part of Israeli life. Every single weekend paper has a section devoted to poetry. The most in Haaretz, who have literally four pages in every Friday paper um, devoted to literature and poetry with poems, at least two or three poems published every week. Um, in the uh, upper left-hand corner, is the poet who you probably most recognize of Israeli poetry, Yehud Amichai. Um, Yehud Amichai was not born with the name Yehud Amichai. He came from, he was an immigrant from Germany at the age of 12. Um, he was from a religious family. He had served in the army and um, was starting his education and was in love with a young woman who left and went to New York. And she said to him, I want you to come with me. And he said, no, I have to stay here. And I think he kind of got the idea because he was a very talented poem poet. And if any of you have read any of his poems, even a translation, and in Hebrew, they are a thousand times more powerful because he wrote for music, very musical poet. And the poems are gorgeous. But even in translation, this comes because of the deep, image that he brought to poems. But at the time that this woman left and went to New York, he changed his name to Yehud Amichai, which is kind of like saying, Jewish, my people live. That's what, exactly what the name means. And he took this on and kind of formed himself into the the, the, the poet of Israel. And, and he really was very smart about making a career for himself as well as, as being um, a very great poet, um, you know, of course, he, he deserved it, but um, it, it was quite intentional. The second from the left, Chaim Nachman Bialik is the last one I'm going to talk about here. Um, Bialik wrote in, in Europe, and he wrote in Hebrew, in a very um, uh, archaic Hebrew, because as he was writing, he was born in the late, uh, you know, in the late uh, 1890s. And he was writing in Hebrew before Hebrew was a language, before Hebrew was a spoken language. Um, and his poems are very, 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 very difficult. He never really lived in Israel. He actually spent most of his time going around in Europe and in Egypt and anywhere where there were Jewish communities and going through um, the Genizas. What's a Geniza? Every synagogue in the world has a room that's kind of a place where you throw old prayer books and old, anything that has God's name on it. We don't just throw it in the garbage, we put it in storage. So these there were rooms with storage of um, vellum books, uh, um, you know, and all of the ancient Israeli poetry was found by Chaim Nachman Bialik, and he would bring these scrolls of vellum back to Israel and get them published. This is how we have the poetry of Yehuda Halevi. This is how we have the poetry of Shmuel Nagid. And the person who um, writes about this the most today and translates these poems is Peter Cole who's a professor at Yale University, and he is a, a scholar and has beautiful books of translations of all of these poems. So, and this is all because of Bialik. Bialik's poems are not translated a lot and the kids in, in uh, Israel have to learn them in high school and they're, they're hard, the poems are hard. Anyway, you can go to the next slide. Okay, so this is a map 
And if you look, it's a map of Europe and Eastern Europe. You see the Crimea over there on the right. Down in the bottom, you see the Maghrib, which is uh, Morocco and uh, Algeria. Um, this is just to give you a very small idea in a picture of what it was like to be a Jew during the 2000 years of our diaspora. Um, we never stayed in any place for very long. Say that we got to Crimea in 1016 and then we were ousted again and then we came back again in 1350 and then we were ousted again and the arrows kind of show where the populations would go. Where did we go? We went where people said it's okay for us to come. We lived under very strict um, laws that were usually made special for us, including how we dressed. Um, the yellow star that uh, Jews were made to wear during the Holocaust was not something new. It came from um, long years of uh, European history where Jews wore yellow caps or yellow shoes or yellow circles or triangles or stars. Um, so that wasn't any, that wasn't something new. We weren't allowed to own land. We weren't allowed to farm. We weren't allowed a lot of things. The reason that Jews became money changers was because that was something that we were allowed. So this just gives you an idea that as the Jews went from place to place and were scattered all over the entire world, in each place we gathered up a little bit of ethnicity from the place from which we came. So if you walk around Israel today, there are Mo Moshavim and Yeshuvim um, little villages where everybody's from India. And when you go there, everybody looks like exactly like people in India. Or you'll go to another place where everybody's from Morocco uh, or from Algeria or from um, Tiber. And they're all speaking the language from which they come. Yiddish is one ancient Jewish language. Ladino is another ancient Jewish language that comes from the Jews of Spain. It's a mixture of Spanish and Hebrew. Um, but there, but there are many homes still today where Jews speak Arabic, or they speak Yiddish, or they speak French or Amharit from Ethiopia, and. The, black, the Jews from Ethiopia look like Ethiopians. And I come from, my parentage is from the Ukraine. And if you look at my face, I look, you know, basically pretty Ukrainian. So as well as how we looked, we also picked up um, interests, thoughts, cultural uh, integration from every single place that we came. And when we all sort of returned to Israel, we brought all of that with us into a big mishmash. And you can go to the next slide, Barb. Today, there are an estimated 33 languages spoken in Israel. So here in Haifa, where I live, if you walk in the streets, you hear Arabic and English, Arabic and English, and a lot of Russian, a lot of Russian. Um, you, When you walk down the street in Haifa, you can't tell who's a Jew and who's an Arab. The, the integration is almost complete. Um, in Jerusalem, it's a very, very different situation. The Arabs from uh, East Jerusalem are in the mall, they're at the restaurant, they're everywhere that, that Jews go, but the Jews kind of um, are in their space and the Arabs are kind of in their space and there's very little integration. In fact, no integration. It's like two parallel worlds existing in the same mall, in the same shop, buying the same thing at the same time. It's a, it's a very strange thing. In Tel Aviv, for the most part, you don't see Arabs in Hajib. I mean, visitors, but not the people who are there on a constant basis. They're much more integrated into Israeli society, sometimes taking on Hebrew names and speaking in Hebrew in order to kind of erase themselves and integrate into the culture um, of Israel. So even here in this little tiny country, in the difference of cities that are an hour away from each other, you'll see these huge um, cultural differences. Go ahead to the next slide. So this is Agi Michel. Agi Michel is known today as the, um, the 
first poet of Israel. She's the most popular. She sells the most books. She's the most beloved. She lives in um, uh, Moshav um, uh, Kfar Mordechai. And she um, writes a lot. Her parents were survivors of the Holocaust. She was not born in Israel. She was born in a refugee camp in Romania. Uh, she came to Israel as a little girl. She has like poems where she was trying, would stand in front of the in front of the mirror in order to try to speak the reish, uh, the R letter in Hebrew in the correct way so that she could fit in with her friends. Um, so poems about integration, the immigrant experience, being the daughter of survivors. She writes a lot about her um, life on the Moshav, which is a farming community. She writes about the ducks. She writes about growing up in Israel. But her poems are very much, um, they're lovely. Uh, and they are um, wonderful. She's not a political poet at all. But I will read um, uh, one of the poems uh, the sermon at Latrun, which is maybe has a little bit more of a political bent. And just to say that she's translated and a number of the poets who are brought here today were translated by my friend, Joanna Chain, who in her own right is a beautiful poet, but she's an amazing translator. The sermon at Latrun. You piss on my love as if it were a bonfire, extinguishing it ember by ember with the arrogance of the perfect crime. And afterwards you cry at night in front of an empty robe, a shirt on a barbed wire hanger. What were you thinking? So your carriages turn into pumpkins, your horses to mice, and rags began peeping through, both of you covered in fig leaves, biting into the apple of knowledge, knowing how to enter and exit the norm. Were you not afraid? Did you never hear that God has no God? You will be wanderers in the cash flow of life, dogs without collars. You will never relax into form, never again hear the heart go boom, a pig's head resting on a tray, a green apple stuffed in its mouth. With this you remain, so saith the Lord. One of the trans problems that translators have when they're translating poems from Hebrew is that many of the lines of poetry come from the many, 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 many sayings and writings from the Torah, from the Bible, going out into the Mishnah and into the Gemara and into, in fact, uh, one of the poems in this packet that I was translating from Amiram Cooper, who was the last poet in the packet, I was translating yesterday, and I was looking at the title of this poem and I couldn't come up with it, finally called my daughter. And she said, yeah, that's somewhere from the Mikra, from the, from the learnings. And, um, and then she remembered that it was actually a line from a song that we sing every Friday night called Adon Olam, the, um, the leader of the earth, which is a, um, a, an ode to God for the most part. And I looked it up and found it there and then was able to translate the entire poem. But I couldn't get it. I couldn't even get started because the saying was so strange. The Hebrew wasn't regular. And yet that's a signal sometimes. Oh, yeah, that's a line somewhere from the liturgy that you have to come up with. Um, go ahead to the next slide. This is Didi Ronane. She is a Tel Avivian uh, poet. Uh, professor at Tel Aviv, a uh, professor of literature at Tel Aviv University, Hebrew literature. Uh, um, and um, she has this poem, In Which the House Readies Itself. She also, for the most part, writes about, um, I would call them women's poems, you know, poems about being a mother, poems about being a wife, poems about travel. Um, but I really love this one. And Joanna also translated it in which the house readies itself. The house is ready for battle. Its walls have widened and thickened to protect its occupants. It rises from its lair, takes a breath, hermetically seals the windows, and through fictitious crenels, 
loads the sentence, the senses to protect its borders. One by one, it gathers us up together with bottled water and canned food. It doesn't give up, isn't scared, does not hesitate or shirk. No one will get away. It dons a layer of steel, mumbling words of prayer, kissing amulets to ensure salvation. If a bomb falls on the house right now, the house will protect those inside it. No one will get away. You will find us among the fractured ruins, clutching each other, our internal organs shattered, our faces pulverized and very protected. So as you can hear from the poems that I chose tonight, um, they speak to what we're all going through. Um, and I'll be happy to talk about more about that at the end of the presentation. So you can go to the next slide. Another Tel Avivian poet, Shimon Adaf, um, was born in Shtirot, which is one of the cities next to Gaza that was attacked on October 7th. Um, and he is now the head of creative writing at Ben Gurion uh, University, which is in Beersheba, which is literally within spitting distance of Gaza, also the, the city of Beersheba. In an obscure land, you know now there will be no more death in this shallow land, a place where every question is still possible. No one will save you. Your pain will not rescue you. Everything now will arrive into what it can be, and you won't need to kneel or sacrifice to any image, free in the weave of humanity. Your ears entombed deep in silence, your eyes torn into night vision, and these letters, signs by which you will understand as you approach your native land, mankind, get up and call out. Go ahead to the next slide. Okay, this is Jonathan Berg. Um, and uh, he's also translated by Joanna. Um, and uh, I've known Jonathan forever. He's married to a really good friend of mine, Gula Gertz, who is a um, literary, um, uh, she helps people get published um, agent. She's a literary agent in Jerusalem. Um, he comes from Psagot, which is a small yeshuv on the West Bank, right outside of Ramallah. You literally have to, as if you're driving into Ramallah to go to, they, they got married there, so I kind of remember it very clearly. Yeah, it's as if you're driving into Ramallah and then you take a quick left and you're in there. So it's it's really right next to the city. Um, and he had a very hard time growing up, a very hard time in the army. And his poems are full of um questions about God, questions about religion, questions about being Israeli, questions about, um, you know, where where we should, we should live and what we should do. Um, he, the poem, his poems are beautifully translated by Joanna, and they have a gorgeous book together. Unity. We travel with the silk road of evening, tobacco and desire flickering in our hands. We're cordial travelers, our eyes wide open, traveling in Psalms, in Rumi, in the sayings of the man from the Galilee. We break bread under the pistachio tree, under the banyan tree, under the dark of the Symmetrian fig tree. Songs of offering rise up in our throats, wandering along the wall of night. We travel in openness of warm eternity, celestial voices announcing a coupling as the quiet horse gallops heavenward. We travel with the rest of the world, with its atrocities, its piles of ruins, scars of barbed wire, traveling with the ardor of our loins, with the cry of birth. We sit cross-legged within the rocking of flesh, 
the quiet of the Brahmian, the bells of mass, the tumult of Torah. We travel through the eagles of death, dilution of earth in rivers, in eulogies, through marble we travel, through the silk of evening, our hearts like the bonfires in the dark. And one more poet that I want to talk about first is Elias Cohen. Elias is a, um, he lives in Kfar Etzion, which is in Gush Etzion, which is just outside Jerusalem, past Bethlehem, also on the West Bank. Um, Elias has less, less problem with it. He's a biblical Eretz Yisrael guy. Um, his poems are very much uh, oriented within the religious structure. Um, he is the founder of a Israeli um, organization called Mashiv Haruach, which is a, a, a dedicated towards the education and publication of religious poetry. And um, I added a couple of poems here that I found online, so I'm sorry about the formatting. Um, they were really picked up as pictures, and I didn't have time to retype them. But I'm going to read the one over on the left. Now close your eyes. Imagine. None of this happened. A night phobia, perhaps a hallucination. That's what it was. The fruit of the feverish poet mind. None of this happened. And the thousand and more did not ascend in a storm. Now open your eyes. Go to, you can go to the next uh, page. So this is Van uh, Nguyen. She's a Vietnamese poet here in Israel. Um, her parents were part of the uh, Vietnam boat people in 1977. They left as refugees from Vietnam to escape communism. The boat they were in wrecked. It washed up on the shore of the Philippines. Um, and the Philippines would not allow her to enter. And they were sent into a refugee camp where they lived until 1979. Menachem Begin allowed 180 Vietnamese families, Israeli citizenship. Her family came to Israel. They also settled in Shtehot and moved around quite a bit. Van was born in Ashkelon, but the family ultimately settled in Yafo, which is right next to Tel Aviv on the, on the water. And that's where she grew up and that's where she lives today. This poem was translated by Adriana Jacobs. Adriana is also foremost in um, translating Hebrew poetry, and she's a wonderful, a wonderful, wonderful translator and poet herself. Culture stain. Examine before you extract seeds of nothing by the riverbank, in the village air and the roads, and so on. In the horizon, a city begins, a portable wax poet without a patron or fanzine. A rosy sun sets on a musical Mont Blanc lake of your eyes. When we hold each other, you'll ask where I come from. I'll say, I came from this rot. Where did I come from, you're asking? I mean, parents? The Israeli um, reviewers talk about her, her poems in such, uh, they were amazed by her, by Van's poems. Um, and she was really welcomed into the Israeli po the world of Israeli poetry. Um, she's won a lot of prizes. Um, all, all of the poets who we've seen up until Van have all been Ashkenazi poets. What does this mean? It means that their parentage, like mine, came somewhere from Europe or Eastern Europe. Van, when Van was growing up in Israel, even though she was a citizen, she had a very hard time. She would have she had a lot of racist bullying because she looked distinctly different from everybody else. And her family practiced a different culture than everybody else. And she had a hard time. Today, she's much more integrated. 
but we're going to go on now to the next slide. A lot in that in that uh, uh, map that we had, where the Jews were scattered all over the world. They weren't just scattered into European countries. They were also scattered into the Arab nations. Jews in Yemen, Jews in Tripoli, Jews in uh, in, in Algeria, in Morocco. Um, the, they all were had lived for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Pretty much okay. In fact, much better. They fared much better than their um, Ashkenazi counterparts in Europe. However, once the state of Israel was declared, they suffered incredible anti-Semitism and needed to be often airlifted by the Israelis and brought or on boats. I really don't, not always sure how it happened. Many of them were put into tent camps um, or very poor housing. Um, they um, suffered from a lot of difference in race. How did this manifest? They didn't get into the same schools. They didn't have the same opportunities. They weren't always allowed in the universities. They, they, there was a, a huge difference between what's called Sephardi or Mizrahi Jews who came from the Arab nations, who spoke Arabic at home, who had different culture, and the highfalutin European Jews. And that disproportion happened here. Um, in 2013, a group of these Jews got together and they made a group called Ars Poetica. And it's very interesting because the word Ars Poetica, for us poets in America, this is from Aristotle, or from Horace, I'm not sure who, but it means a poem that you write, that it talks about writing poetry. That's what an Ars Poetica is. However, the word Ars, as it's written in Hebrew, Ayin Reish Samech there above the R's uh, means a low life guy. I remember that when my girls were growing up, they would say, "Oh, we don't want to go there. All those boys are arsing." They would like, the, "Yeah, those are the those are the low da, those are the low guys, you know, with the with the weirdo haircuts or the their uh, or the not nice boys." They would use the word arse. Um and. So Ars Poetica took on this duality. You're poets, you're gathering together as poets, but you're you're the you're the low lifes, but we're gonna embrace that. We're gonna sing it loud and proud. This revolutionized the poetry world in Israel because the Ars Poetica movement became very strong, very as loud and proud, absolutely. And um the poets became some of the most uh, well-known and most vocal poets in the country. So if you go to the next slide. So this is Roy Hassan. I think he's an, an, such an amazing poet. Um, he so much takes from his, uh, his culture and switches it up in the most amazing way. In fact, as I was uh, typing this poem up yesterday, I even started Started to cry. It's, it's so beautiful um, how he takes his family life and extrapolates the poem to reach out into the cultural question between the Ashkenazi and the Sephardi Jews. And then even the higher cultural question, who am I as a Jew in the world beyond me? And he does all of this by talking about the tree in his garden. I'm going to read the poem and then I'm going to play, I have Barb play this video by the Khan um, poetry people. Khan is an organization. I don't really know them, who they are, who put them together. I could have found out, but I don't know. Um, they create these videos around poems and hundreds of them where they do the most amazing thing. You'll see in the video how they extrapolate the lines of the poems and show it in a way that enhances the poem. Um, they all also have incredible videos about the lives of Israeli poets. Um, 
there's one about uh, Abba Kovner, there's one about um, uh, uh, Avod Yashurin, there's one about um, Yona Wallach, who was a, an amazing poet, and they do them in really creative, beautiful ways. If the, you read, if you look at them in Hebrew, they're free. If you uh, want them with English translation, they cost a few dollars, I think about $15. Um, but you can find them on the internet. So I'm going to read this poem, and then I'm going to ask Barb to um, to please uh, play the video for us. I'm sorry I couldn't put the the lines into the video itself, but YouTube charges now to be able to download a video and do that. I have a couple of others that I did in the past in this presentation, but the tree. As I removed the cork, I was satisfied. The tree that had alone survived the inferno of Yogo's piss, that dog among dogs who had already destroyed too, and now reaching height, though bent at the root and still burdened with heavy fruit that hung like sumo wrestlers swinging from an acrobat's trapeze in the circus. Yoko circled the grounds on grass, some green, some dead, reminding me with a single glance, who is the real owner of this house? My daughter, who hugs her pink teddy in her sleep, the bear she calls Boo, and mornings she calls us Mommy, Daddy, and I call her Asi my sunny sunshine girl, and every once in a while, I call her Imola. And with everything is just so wonderful, terrible, soft, and only the maniac moon lights me up at midnight, corkscrews me from an oath of wine, when I promise myself to be this tree, even if every dog in this world will piss on me, bend me i will stand firm clinging to all that fruit go ahead barb if you oh, click if you click anywhere it'll start i just need to get uh, my apologies i need to stop share because i didn't enable sound i've neglected to but let me just stop share and then enable sound okay. and then we can hear it sorry about that um where are we um share sound all right, here we go. כשחלצתי את הפקק עוד הייתי מבסוט, העט ששרד לבדו את תופת השתן של יוקו, הכלב בן כלב, שהרג כבר שניים, תפס גובה וקרע תחת, נטל פירותיו הכבדים שניטלו עליו כמו מתאבקי סומו מתנדנדים על מתקן אקרובטיקה בקרקס. יוקו הסתובב על משטח, הדשא היפה והמת הזכיר לי במבטו מבעל הבית. ביתי מחבקת דובי ורוד בשנתה היא קוראת לו בוא ובבוקר היא קוראת לנו אימא אבא, ואני קורא לה אסי, ילדת שמש שלי, ולפעמים אני קורא לה אימא, והכל כל כך נפלא, נורא, ורך ורק הירח המניאק, מאיר עליי חצות, חולץ ממני שבועת יין. לעצמי אני מבטיח להיות העץ הזה, גם עם כל הכלבים של העולם הזה. ישתינו עליי וכופפו אותי לאמוד, להחזיק את הפירות. So I love that you can hear his voice, see his face. You can see the poor neighborhood where he lives. Um, those, you know, those old buildings. Um, and... I just think um, the way that Khan did it with the words popping out like that, it's, I, I don't know how much you saw or understood, but it's, uh, I, I really love it. Go ahead to the next slide. All right, this is Almog Bahar. 
Um, he is, he's, he's, uh, lives in Yerushalayim. He's a real activist, um, a, a philosopher. Um, he's published six books of poetry. And he also did an anthology called Steim, where he brought together, um, I don't remember how many, I think it was about 60 Israeli poets and 60 um, Palestinian poets. And he published them in the same anthology together. Steim is the word for two. Um, and it was a really beautiful anthology. I was in touch with him once because I wanted to do a possible translation of this entire book. And he was just like, yeah, you've got to go to all the, all the 120 poets, including the Palestinians and get permission from everybody. And I was like, okay, I'm, I don't know. I think I was in my master's program then I was doing something else. And I was just like, okay, that's overwhelming. I don't think I'm going to do that. But um, he grew up in an Arab Arabic speaking household. And he talks about it here. My Arabic is mute strangled at the throat, cursing itself without uttering a word, sleeping in the airless shelters of my soul, hiding from relatives behind the Hebrew shutters. And my Hebrew is raging, running among rooms and neighbors, balconies, making its voice heard in public, prophesizing the coming of God and bulldozers. And then it holds up in the living room, thinking itself so open in the language of its skin, so hidden between the pages of its flesh. A moment naked, a moment later dressed, it curls up into the armchair and begs itself for forgiveness. My Arabic is petrified. It quietly pretends to be Hebrew and whispers to friends whenever somebody knocks at her gate. Alan, Alan, welcome. And whenever a policeman passes it on the street, it produces an ID card and points out the protective clause. Ani min al Yehud, Ani min al Yehud. I am a Jew, I am a Jew. And my Hebrew is deaf, sometimes very deaf. So I love how he's using language here and the discussion of language, even in a translated poem, to talk about the fact that um, his roots are in, an, in Arabic. His home life was in Arabic. And yet here he is at home, in Jerusalem, where he grew up, and yet speaking his home language in the street is causing him problems. Now, I should also say that my very Ashkenazi six foot four son with a great big beard also gets stopped in the street and his ID card has to be produced. I think that they probably stop a lot of men of a certain age walking around in Jerusalem. The security situation is always tenuous here and usually um, not on October 7th, but usually the Israelis have been pretty good about keeping us as secure as, as they can. Um, so, but this particular man felt very uh, at a front when he's questioned and has to uh, proclaim, yeah, I'm, I'm Jewish um, and coming when we look back at our history, um, especially the stories out of the Holocaust of boys who had to pull down their pants to prove that they were Jews or be shown that they were Jews. So you cannot quite understand how that affront happens. Go ahead to the next page, Barb. Um, I just wanted to check. I did get a message from a viewer that they are only having a blank Zoom screen. Is everyone else able to see the share? You can just... Your... Yes, I'm able to see it, Barb. Good. Okay. Thank you. Maybe they should step, go out and come back in. Okay. So this is really um, an, an, an interesting poet. The, he was the oldest member of the Ars Poetica movement when it was set up. His name is Erez Biton. Erez came from Algeria as a little boy. His parents, uh, again, were living very poor under a lot of discrimination when at the age of 10, he was in an accident and he was blinded. And because he was blinded, he was sent to Jerusalem, to the Jerusalem School of the Blind. And there he got a really better education than he would have had and greater opportunities. 
And he says, I only became a poet because I had access to this really great education because I was blinded. As, as a Mizrahi boy, that was ha his access into um, the world of education and poetry. So this is a wonderful poem that I also translated and I embedded my translation into the poem so you can read it as he's saying it. And it's a wonderful poem about somebody who came from Algeria, a woman who came from Algeria where she lived, you know, high and a kind of a great life and came to Israel and things changed drastically for her. So go ahead, Barb, if you click on it, it'll start. Zohar al-Fasiyya. Zohar al-Fasiyya, Zamerit Hatser, Tzel Muhammad Hamishi, Barabat Sheba Marok. אומרים עליה שכאשר שרה לחמו חיילים בסכינים לפלס דרך בהמון להגיע לשולי שמלתה לנשק לקצות אצבעותיה להטיל מטבע ריאה לאות תודה זור על פסייה. היום ניתן למצוא אותה באשקלון בעתיקות ג' ליד לשכת הסעד שיראה קופסאות סרדינים על שולחן מתנודד בין שלוש רגליים שטיחי מלך מרהיבים מרובבים על מיטת סוכנות והיא בחלוק בוקר בהוי שעות במראה בצבעי איפור זולים. וכשהיא אומרת מוחמד החמישי, אישו לעינינו, אינך מבין ברגע הראשון. לזוהר אלפסיה קול צרוד, לב צלול ועיניים מלאות אהבה. זוהר אלפסיה. So that was, I, I know it went really fast. It was, you know, she was a singer for Muhammad V and um, she had this great life. And then you could find her now in Israel eating sardines out of the can on a three-legged uh, table and remembering, you know, talking about the, the king from Morocco and how he was such a looker. Um, I love this poem because it talks about that change that people went through when they immigrated to Israel. And really ju not just the Sephardim, Israel was really hard in the early days. Um, it was, resources were quite limited. You were allowed to have a bucket of water, 30, 30 grams of, of meat and one egg per person in the house. Um, every, you know, every day or twice a week or, and that was true through the 60s, it, you know, it wasn't always easy um, to, to live in Israel. And I think it's only really recently with the tech boom that Israel has become more of an economically stable place. Go ahead to the next slide. Zohar. All right, so I'm not gonna keep up with these. This is Ronnie Somek. Um, you know what, I'll, I'll read this one and I won't read Haviva uh, Padaya's um, poem. Um, uh, Rani is uh, is also um, uh, a poet, uh, I think Baghdadi. Um, he was born in Iraq in 1951. Um, but he he and Khaviva, the next poet, are are also Mizrahi poets, but they didn't join Ars Poetica. They have become amongst the most popular poets in the country just through their own right and their own um, uh poems. Um, dream Treaties, a belated report from a seminar of Arab and Jewish poets in Beit Berry in 1994. Um, is Beit Berry, uh, Kibbutz Berry? Uh, it might be, I don't know. Um, there were half green lawns, miserly sprinklers, and one scary moment when my daughter vanished from view. She was three at the time, and after a search of several minutes, she grinned from ear to ear, standing in a wagon usually used for distributing towels. And Samih al Qasim and Muhammad Hazma Gahayem's children had trundled her from one end of the other of the hall, where more than a field of thorns could have been planted in the furrows plowed by adults' brows. Afterward, the children traded roles and the cart continued to sail like a pleasure ship in the puddles of words choked in two languages. So I wanted to be captain or a deck boy or even just a life boy on that voyage. And I was madly envious of the children 
who had the, their paper and pencil would, would in a space of 10 minutes have signed dream treaties. One day I was in um, the natural spring that my last name is named after, a place that I love in the Judean desert. And it was a hot Saturday afternoon. And like I said, in the Jerusalem area and Ju the Judean desert is right next to Jerusalem. The, the Arabs, the local Arabs and the Jews exist in the sa same pleasure places, but are usually re really in separate roles. I remember once I was there and a woman my age, a heavy grandmother type, came down and she had trudged through the desert a little bit to get there and she was winded and I offered her my bottle of water and she looked at me like if I take your water I'm going to be in so much trouble with my people so no <laughs> um so there was came this one really hot afternoon and the spring was some um uh it's uh, called a Mayan poem uh um Oh, I'm trying to remember the word in English. It's it's a natural spring where all the water disappears and then refills itself because of the underground aquifer and how it's the water is distributed underneath the ground. And the water was full and all the kids, because it was so hot, were playing together. And there was a high place where the kids would jump off of. And you could see the Jewish boys and the Arab boys saying to each other, no, you go, no, you go. And it was as if everybody was all the same together. And I remember this, looking at these boys playing in the water together and thinking, if only it could be like this, that the dreams of children were all ready to sign these dream treaties. Um, and I think that there are very few people in this country, very few people who I've met, and I lived almost all my life in Israel, and most of that has been in uh, on the west bank okay amongst the, the 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 crazies if you will um most people want peace that's what we want we want peace uh, how much we're willing to sacrifice for peace i think we're willing to sacrifice a lot are we willing to sacrifice the Jew a jewish nation that ultimately is is always the question um go ahead to the next poem so this is Chaviva Padaya. It's a really long poem. She's a teacher at also Baghdadi poet um, and um, amazing. She is a teacher in literature, but she's also a teacher in Zohar and Jewish, Jewish mysticism. Her poems are incredibly philosophical. They're rarely translated into English. Um, and uh, She's a great poet to, to look for. Very, very interesting poet. Go ahead. So after the success of the Ars Poetica movement, the mo one of the uh, groups uh, the, um, in Israel who have had a long history since the time of Jesus, of constantly being a race that has been burdened and kept separate from everybody because the Jews of Ethiopia went to Ethiopia about the turn of around the, the time of the life of Jesus and then remained in, in Ethiopia, cut off from all other Jewish nations for 2,000 years. When they were found, they were called Falishmoras. They weren't allowed to walk outside of their little tiny um, places. They were extremely poor. They were shunned from the regular Ethiopian communities. Um, I believe it was in 1990, 1991, that uh, a rich Jew from America paid an enormous ransom of tens of millions of dollars. And then the Israeli Air Force painted El Al Jets 747s took all the seats out in order to make more room. And the piloted by Israeli Air Force guys who were dressed in t-shirts and jeans. And over a period of time of about 45 hours, airlifted 14,500 
Ethiopian Jews to Israel. When they got here, um, there was a uh, an educator who was working on special ed programs. So I was reading his books by the name of Fornstein because he was working on special ed programs to help disabled kids. I have a disabled kid who in 1991 was three years old. And um, they he left helping us and went to work with the Ethiopian kids who had never sat in classrooms whose counting was different. So they all of a sudden were dropped in this Western country of which they thought like they were going to God. They thought like, this is it. The, the, the redemption has come and we are going to meet the Messiah by being flown to Israel. Um, and they were very surprised to find themselves again in with a lot of racism, um, a difficult time, poor environment, Israel had to rewrite education for them. Many, many, many have succeeded marvelously in this country. But these Ethiopian kids got together and said, you know what? We've got our own poetry. We don't want to be part of Ars Poetica or the Ashkenazi scene. We want our scene. And if you look at this over on the right-hand side, this is their logo. And in there, in the first word, it says, the, o the Ethiopians. And the words that are highlighted in Hebrew there say yofi, beautiful, okay? And um, I translated one of the poets, go ahead to the next slide, Orita Shuma, who today, I think she just had a baby and she is very much into a career being an actress. I, when I was in the middle of my PhD, I got together with all these kids and I said, come on, let's do an anthology. You give me your poems, even if they're slam, I'll make them into a written word poetry and we'll write, get them translated into English and get them out there. And I bought them all dinner one night, like 15 kids uh, after they had a reading in Haifa. And after that, they, they kind of disbanded. I don't think that they perform together anymore. They've all gotten married, had babies. Um, and a lot of them are in um, careers of acting and doing other things. But Orit here has a slam poem where she talks about the beauty of her community. So go ahead and hit on it. קצב בכתפיים, קפה אבו נעימים בצהריים, הכנסת האורחים, ביקורי החולים, אוכל שמזין, קסם ברגליים, לחיצת יד בשתי ידיים, אומנות הסבלנות, ההתמסרות, הקידה למבוגרים, האומץ שבצעירים, אירועים עם אלפי אנשים שבאים לנחם או לשמח בלי תמורה. וקר את המורשת בסדה ישראל, סליחה. כמעט שכחתי להשאיר לך מקום, תראי, זהותי נפלה בשבי מלחמות היומיום. האירוניה שבטה ישראל כבר בבית של גזייה ורמלק ישראל עוררה בי מבוכה. עד שמצאתי את עצמי מתעטפת בשרידי האמונה, עד שתחלוף לה עוד סערת הכפשה או גחמה של פרופסורים לפיקפוקים, שתכלס, מה בדיוק הם יודעים עלינו. הרי זו רק אתיופיה. ואלוהי ישראל עדים שאלפיים חמש מאות שנים את היית לנו למקלט. איך בסוף הגענו? איך שרדנו? לא שכחנו את ירושלים, אה? אבל די מהר שכחתי אותך, תראי, זה לא שאני חוזרת. את הרי יודעת ש... אין לי ארץ אחרת. ישראל היא האחת. אך אדם השוכח עברו יעשה טעויות כל ימי חייו ואני נתתי לכל מי שרצה להגדיר את זהותי על העוול בכפי עד שחלומות של אבות אבותיי לופפו סביב קרסוליי שאבו אותי אל קרקע את הנפש מצופים של דיכוי ממסדי וסטטיסטיקות ניסו לעוות לי את הרגש אבל לא לסתם קוראים לנו ג'גנה רק האמיצים יעזו לצלול אל תוך השקט בשקט אל עבר הספינה שננטשה רק שם מצאתי את אוצר הנחמה ונשבעתי שאני מעדיפה למות פיראטית מאוד מכונה, רק רגע לפני שאני יוצאת לדרך, תני לי לבקש סליחה, וקר את עייני נת אתיופיה, לא באמת אוכל להחזיר לך בחזרה, מהשיער הקשוח עד האור המתוח, הקצב בכתפיים, 
קפה הבונה, עם אמא בצהריים, הכנסת האורחים, ביקורי החולים, אוכל שמזין, קסם ברגליים, לחיצת יד בשתי ידיים, אומנות הסבלנות, ההתמסרות, עקידה למבוגרים, האומץ שבצעירים, אירועים עם אלפי אנשים שבאים, באים, באים, באים. לנחם או לשמח בלי תמורה. וקר תעייני נת אתיופיה, סליחה, כמעט שכחתי להשאיר לך מקום. תני לי לכתוב לך במקום. בסדר רבה. So, um, yes, someone in the chat had asked for links, and I, I will send to, um, to, to, to you all, um, all of the links uh, to these YouTubes that I created. And then if you slow them down from regular speed to 75 speed, it's easier to read along with the poem. Um, anyway. So this last poet in the package is Amiram Cooper, who was born in 1938 in Israel and lived most of his life. In fact, he was a creator of the kibbutz uh, near, near Oz. Um, he was captured on October 7th and taken from his bed in his underwear. And he has been in captivity ever since in, uh, in Gaza. He's 85 years old. He has no access to his medication. He has no access to know that everybody's crying for him to come home. Uh, he, he's in some dark place or being moved place to place. We've heard uh, from the people who were captive, who came out, all kinds of stories about what they went through in the shorter time that they were inside. Um, people who were kept in complete darkness, who have lost their minds, um, children who still can't speak. Um, so it turns out that Amiram Cooper was a professor of economics, very well educated, created this beautiful kibbutz, settled it and lived there all his life with his children and his grandchildren. And on top of that, he's a poet. And I found um, a book of poems of his in a PDF form, which I'm also willing to share if anybody reads Hebrew, but his poems are not, e not that easy because I translated this one yesterday and I did a very simplistic job. So I, I beg your forgiveness because this poem, um, when one translates, there's getting the words and then there's playing with the words. And as you play with the words, you come to a greater and greater and greater understanding of the poem. And I was telling Barb uh, earlier, it's almost like, you know, when we used to take pictures with film and then you'd put them into certain chemicals and all of a sudden the picture of the, would, would appear through the chemicals. And that's how I feel when I translate poetry, when all of a sudden, you know, like the poem falls into place and I say, oh, that's, I knew what the poem was about, but I didn't realize, wow, you know, now I see it really clearly. Um, so this is, oh, this is just a single translation job, very quick. As I told you, I had to call my daughter in the middle. Um, a lot of the words are from the liturgy. Um, and he write, wrote poems about um, planting and growing, and they often appear in this format where there's a, a one and a two, where the one is more about the natural world, and then the two goes more into the philosophical thoughts. Um, the book that I saw after each poem, he wrote music to go with the poems, drew small little pictures um, to go with the poems. They, the, the most exquisite work, you know, like when he was done being a professor of economics and and doing all the work for the kibbutz, uh, he would sit and write these poems. And he had three published, he has three published books of po poetry. Hold on, because I want to read from the page and not from the screen. When the world is no more, one. When the world is no more, the dawn rises and yellows the wheat. And the virginal oats, blackened bristles, each resting one next to the other, 
bending under the weight of a possible rest in a bush swimming in liquid, guessing what's at the end soon, soon, the summer, a border. A blade moves and heads are severed. The threshing drum hits and breaks in order to expose the wheat from the chaff. Two. And I am quietly turned upside down, quietly scattered from the leftover straw to black, and a land cracked with pain and silence, plowing the abandoned body. The summer will pass, the autumn arrive, and a nucleus will, will survive to wipe his tears, hidden anew in the si as, and the silence returns not to imitate any promise of the earth, but because she who gifts this return will be like a new seed. A cotledon will give the new plant a salve so that the suffering grains can flourish until the end. And I am just going to send out a prayer that Amiram should very soon in the coming days wake up in his own bed and be allowed to have his freedom in the end. Okay, so that's it. And thank you very much, everybody, for joining me. So if you have, everyone can unmute, and if anyone has questions. I have two questions, um, if I may. <laughs> Hi, Raquel. That was, hey, Susan. <laughs> that was so wonderful. I learned um, just an amazing amount from Thank it. You. And I loved how you blended in, braided some, all the information about Israel with the information about the poetry. It was really masterfully done. Um, so one, one question was very specific about the Aggie Michelle poem, because you said you'd chosen poems that speak somehow to you to the moment and I wondered what about her poem um that you read uh uh made you made you in particular think of it as as speaking to the to the moment and the other is a more general question just about whether the Misrahi poets who speak Arabic ever write in Arabic and what their relationship is with the with the non-Jewish Arabic poets you know, Almog Bahar used to have the most amazing website. When I looked up, um, I, I didn't find anything. I didn't find it. Um, so I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't know if they're Arabic because they aren't educated in Arabic. Right. Mm. This is this is like my kids and my kids. Um, my kids can write papers in English. Um, I don't have anyone who writes poetry per se, uh, or does any kind of creative writing. Um, my kids are really creative, but not, they're all visual artists. Um, so um, I wouldn't, I don't know, you know, how much they, you know, sometimes a lot of kids who are brought, brought up in a dual language situation will have the home language and the outside language, and they'll go to school and not know the word for pillow. You know, that, that kind of thing happens. Yeah. So it really depends on the household and the education. But I know for me that my kid's second language was English. We spoke English at home and I was that kind of mom. I read to them in both languages. And when I saw that there would be reading books, if they would choose like two Hebrew books at night to read to themselves. I would slip in an English one, or if I saw that they were getting too much English, I would slip in a Hebrew one in order that they, the languages wouldn't strain each other. Um, the sermon, Latrun is a, when you're driving down highway one between Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, Latrun is a memorial to a war. And there's a great big tank on a great big piece of cement next to the highway. And there was a huge battle in Latrun, and everybody knows about this battle. And the poem is speaking about the um, forces between um, the forces that want peace and the forces that want war. When you say you piss on my love, 
She's not talking about intimate love. She's talking about humanity and a love between, you know, in a, and I don't even know necessarily that she's directing it towards the Palestinians at all. I think she's directing it actually in uh, to our our leaders. I think that's, that that's what that's she's what doing. I wondered who whom yeah. she was addressing. Yeah, right. thank you. Yeah. yeah. Anyone else have questions? I just I wanted to comment, Rahel. I I know last month when we had um, uh, the the Palestinian poet presenter, she also talked about how the majority of people also in Palestine, uh, the Palestinians want peace and feel very comfortable with the Israelis as their friends and neighbors. Um, what 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 would you say is the um, percentage? I mean, is that most people or a small percentage? I mean, how, how do you see it where you are anyway? Okay, I between 1985 and 1990, I lived in an Arab city. Okay, I lived in a in a Jewish home that had been bought before nineteen, you know, it, it had been it had been owned by Jews in the in the eighteenth century, called Beit Romano, um, but I lived in an Arab city, completely surrounded. We were I was family number twenty seven, and we were completely surrounded by Arabs all the time, and we different from the rest of the Jewish community. We did our shopping. I did my shopping in the Casbah. That's where I went to buy my kids shoes or material to make curtains for the house. And there are my fruits and vegetables. The fruit and vegetable guy used to write down Heimowitz in Arabic and give me credit. And my interpretation at the time, I went to live there in the same, the same reason that currently I'm living in a Druze city outside of Haifa. Um, I, I believe in building bridges and making connections. And my feeling is that most people want to earn a living, put food on the table, go every once in a while to the movies, raise their kids, and enjoy their life. That's how most human beings want to exist in this world, at one level or another. And it's very hard to do that if you don't have access to education, or you don't have access to um, where you're being propagandized all the time. And then you start to look, where's the power? We are inundated with incredibly bad leaders in a world that believes that the bullet and the missile are the way to solve problems. And I think that the, the um, the Jewish return, I don't know who, who might have read the recent article in the Atlantic about the fact that Jews are an indigenous people and we're not actually colonial settlers. Um, it's If you haven't read it, go read It's an amazing article. I don't know who this guy was who wrote it, but wow. Um, it was wonderful for him to write that truth that for me is very important. I came to live in Israel because I fell in love with the land on the first day I was here. And I fell in love with the land because something deep in my soul from my people, and I only, I don't feel it every, I don't feel it here in Haifa. I feel it in certain areas in the hills of Jerusalem and in the desert of Jerusalem. That's where my people come from. It's so clear to me. Um, and um, I believe that, um, that, uh, we want to build bridges and we want to make, uh, we want to create peace. Most people are good. And this was a great, great experiment, this place. What would have happened? Would the Messiah have come? What would have happened if an indigenous people returns to their land after 2000 years and the indigenous people who are living in the land welcome them and can be together? It's not, we're not very different from each other. The Palestinians and the, and, the, and the Israelis are very similar people. None of us are easy. And we all can tolerate each other. When, as I said, when you walk down the street in Haifa, outside of the Russian immigrants who are a very strong majority and have kept their language and their culture very much in place, a lot like the Americans, though there are way fewer Americans in Israel than there are Russians. Um, any outside of the Russians, you can't tell who's who. 
and when you're walking down the street in Haifa, everyone's and I, I I recently broke my hand. I was in the uh, in the hospital. Everybody, all the nurses and all the doctors speak all three languages, <laughs> and they have to. They they have to they have to cater to the people who come in who are sick, and they need to speak Russian and Arabic and Hebrew, and they're fluent in all three languages. This is how it should be. And I'm so glad that the Palestinian woman said so too. It gives me a tremendous hope to hear that. Are there any other questions? Just unmute yourself if you'd like to ask a question. Well, Barb, I'd, I'd like, I'm very interested in the connection you have with Rahel. How did you guys get together and how did you come up with this presentation? Well, uh, I, Barb, Barb thought it up. Barb and I are in a writing group together. We we uh, we we write together twice a week, so that's yeah. how we know each other. And to answer your question as to how the whole program came about, it's just I felt we were all getting bombarded uh, with very um, biased information, and I just sort of intuited that there was a connection between. Um, the Palestinians and the Israelis that we weren't seeing. And most likely that would take the form of art of one form or another. And, you know, of course, poetry. <laughs> so that's that's kind of the genesis of this this two part program. And I'm so grateful, Rahel. This was amazing. I don't know if you've seen the notes in the chat, but this was just an amazing, comprehensive look at at um, at, at not just poetry but of history so really appreciate it thank you very much i really appreciate you inviting me it's wonderful to be able to it was wonderful to translate a lot of these poems and to put this together i especially enjoyed roy hassan that poem about the tree i you know wow <laughs> oh my... i'm just gonna stand here holding the fruit <laughs> <laughs> yeah right my favorite was the one about the boat in the in the the cart that was going back and forth in this. Yes. And, uh, just, yes. Oh, just wonderful. I can see why you wept when you reread it. So, boy. All right. Any other comments or um, questions from the audience? All right. What I'd like to do, I want to also invite you, um, let me just do a share screen here of our next presentation um, on uh, next month, uh, on February 24th, we're going to have a wonderful, very, very um, vibrant poet, educator, actor, Ira Joe Fisher, doing a presentation on perform your poems like a pro. He His, his feeling is it's not reading a poem, it's performing a poem. So I hope you can join us there, then. Um, it, it's if you if you go to the CPS website, you'll find information on how to register. So um and Pat, any any last words from you at all? I just want to thank everyone for, for attending and especially uh, thank Rahel for a fabulous presentation. Uh, and, and, you know, as president of CPS, our, our goal is to bring programs like this to you and, and they're free of charge, open to the public, and uh, they're just so worthwhile. So spread the word about CPS, even if you don't want to be a member, check out our websites and take advantage of all of these programs that we, we put together for you. Right. Oh, and great poetry competitions as well. So uh, go have, to go to the CPS website and you can learn about those also. So. The contests uh, going on too. So um, check out our website. Yeah, absolutely. Rahel, thank you so much. Oh my gosh. Everybody open, you can turn on your mics and give her a hand. Thank you. <laughs> so, thank you, thank everybody. You so much. All right, and we will, um, I'll have, um, I'll get from Rahel the, the links, the YouTube links, and we'll get them to you um, through your through your registration. So um, you'll be able to see the, the, the wonderful poems in, you know, slow them down perhaps a little bit too, so. All right, well, thank you. Everyone. Thank you. Thank See you, you again. Thank you. Bye, that everybody. Was... Thank Bye. you. Stay warm, everyone. <laughs> Thank you, Rahel. Thank you. Oh, boy. Lead road. Bye. <laughs> All right. I want to make sure I can get this uh, this YouTube, vi uh, this video downloaded. So thanks, Pat.
Oh, Barb, thank you. Oh, um, what a wonderful program. Oh, my gosh. I, do, I don't need to do anything else in order to stop recording, right? Just oh, 